One of the most common questions I get asked is, did you drop the soap in the shower? <laughs> well, you're probably wondering how on earth I survived this environment. You know, I'm no tough guy. Over 100 people arrested with me from the raves, including some of my bouncers, including a massive best friend of mine who was one of my bouncers called Wildman, who I grew up with in my hometown. His fists are twice the size of mine, covered in teeth marks and all the fighting. So he protected me when I first went in. Later on, when I was split from my co-defendants, the guys I was writing about on my blog started protecting me because they were getting letters and books sent to them from all over the world. One of the guys whose story I was writing was a guy called Two Tonys. He was an Italian mafia mass murderer. He left dead bodies from Tucson to Alaska, but he claimed they all had it coming because they were rival gangsters, so he didn't see anything wrong with that. Now, if you've murdered gangsters, you're at the top of the pecking order in the prison. I did have problems with the Orion Brotherhood and Two Tonys made them go away. So I was in a very unique situation. But if you're a young person going in and you don't know anyone, it's just raw survival of the fittest, basically. So, heaven help you, basically. All right, who's, who's got another question? Right here. What job do you do now? My job right now, because I've got a criminal record, I had to go and employ myself. I went into debt to employ myself as a public speaker and a writer. I've got a book out, I don't make much of it, and I do a lot of these talks as well. I did 119 talks in the previous academic years. That's my full um, term, time job now, basically. Yeah. At the back? Uh, did you ever try to escape? Did I try to escape? <laughs> you, uh, if any of you guys know how the, how the razor wire works around the prison, yeah. the razor wire's got a chemical on it, so when you slash yourself escaping, your blood doesn't clot and it leaves a trail of blood in the direction that you're escaping in. Now, I never tried to escape because it, it would have added five more years onto my sentence. The last guy who tried to escape, he was rearrested. Earlier, I mentioned that the underwear was pink, red pink box, boxes and socks. He was rearrested running naked down the street in his pink socks because the razor wire shredded all of his clothes off him. And he got another five years added to his sentence. How old are you now? Right now, I am 43. Yeah. Anyone got any questions for my mom? Uh, why didn't they send me to a UK prison? I could have done a prison transfer, but because I was on remand for so long, for over two years, you've got to be sentenced. And by the time the transfer would have gone through, it would have ended up with me actually doing more prison time. But good question, but that's why I didn't do it. But, go on. How long did T-Bone have? T-Bone served over 20 years. But he was in, yeah, he was in and out. He was a Marine and he moved to Arizona and he started making money from doing um, bodyguarding people. And the money he was making, he started investing it in cocaine. So he set up his own cocaine business. He had debts to collect and he threatened some people at gunpoint. And that was one of his, his major charges. So he living that gangster lifestyle, you know, that he, that he thought was cool, got him over 20 years. How many fights did you have in prison? Not many at all. I mean, like I said, I got no bones broken out, no, no teeth knocked out or anything like that. It was about four total. Yeah. yeah, being in jail, I saw all these round-the-clock drug users because over 90% of them are shooting up heroin and crystal meth. Up to two-thirds of them are hepatitis C. There's more drugs in the jails and prisons than anywhere on the face of the earth. I saw the yellow jaundiced skin, the teeth rotting out, how old beyond their years they looked. It was like I was getting a future, a future glimpse of what you know, my own drug abuse could lead to. It just put me off it for the rest of my life. Like, like, any, like, one yeah, I mean, one of the first ones in my book is the white smashed this other white in the shower and then this other white with cobwebs tattooed on his neck. He goes up to the head of the whites and he says, how come we can still hear him? Oh, we smashed him good, dog. It's like not good enough. He goes into the shower and it's like he's trying to break open this guy's head like it's a coconut, just crack, 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 crack. A guard does a security walk. Because he just leaves the body down, the guard does a security walk. I've never seen violence at this level before, so I'm just, my heart's just going constantly. I push my face to the window, because I want to see what the damage is on this guy. And there's not just blood, he's on a stretch, he looks dead, there's not just blood coming out of his head. There's yellow fluid, like brain stuff. I still have nightmares about all the violence. But like I said, you know, I brought the law, so I brought it all on myself. How do you feel now when, like, people are looking at you, they know what you've done? 
How do I feel? I feel like I am. Um, they say um, your prison sentence is repaying your debt to society. But I feel talking to young people is a better way for me. I get emails almost every day from students. And they say, we hear there's going to be a drugs talk, we roll our eyes, we play on our phones in the hall, we don't listen to our teachers or our parents. But because your story's true, you know, we can relate to it. I didn't just go in there and say, don't take drugs, I told you what happened to me. And they can relate to it, and it shows them what drugs lead to without telling them how to live their lives. So, you know, I feel good about that myself now. And it's, I send my mom these emails as well, and it's, it's restoring me in her eyes as well from all the, all the bad I did previously. Yeah. Well, um, did you do any other drug apart I did. My drugs I was doing was what I classified as club drugs, which was like um, ecstasy, special K, um, stuff like that. And I thought I wasn't a drug addict, but I was in denial. The, the psychotherapist said to me, Sean, are you a drug addict? I said, no, I just do club drugs. I'm a functional recreational drug user. I go to work on the weekdays. A drug addict is someone who wakes up in the morning and shoots heroin into the arm. I'm not one of those people. He said, Sean, a drug addict is someone who does drugs to the point where it affects their life. Take a look around you. Where are you right now? And I was like, okay, <laughs> wake up call. You know, so I realized, but I've not been doing it, you know, and I'm not going to be doing it, so. Anyone back up there? I never got any tattoos. They call me a blankie. I was the odd one out. I'm a serial home invader torturer, he turned our cell into an illegal tattoo shop. He took the motor out of a Walkman, attached it to a guitar string and a needle, which he ran through a pen, and the motor from his Walkman powered his tattoo gun. For ink, there was a hair gel product you could buy. He burnt it for hours and end in a contraption. The smoke collected into soot, and the, the soot was his black ink. He also had a corrupt female guard smuggling coloured ink in for him as well. How did you break the music? Um, how did I break my fingers? I was sparring in karate, because I'm, I'm brown belt right now, I've just got one more to go. And I got, I got kicked in the hand, and I also got punched in the ribs. It's my own fault for not blocking properly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just concerned that some people may have to leave. Sean and Barbara are quite happy to 